Thank you for tuning in. This is Haas sitting with Ahmad Tarek, also known as AT. And we have a very special guest, Tainui. Tainui is a photographer and he has been on interesting experiences around the world. I'm looking forward to hear about it. What's up, guys? What's up, brothers? How's it going, brethren? <laughs> <laughs> That's the intro for everyone. <laughs> All right. So I'm curious, Tainui, how did you get into photography? Yeah. So my mother was into it when we were kids up in Seattle. Uh, most of our family was either back in Utah or in California or in New Zealand or Australia. And so this was the early days of blogging. Uh, she had this great blog and we we're all these little kids, right? So she had all the nice camera equipment and a guy who my father was um, the mentor of it was really into photography. He was uh, my mother's mentor within photography. And then years, years, years down the road, after we moved to Utah, my mother no longer had as much of a need or a passion for doing photography. So she had all the camera equipment kind of gathering dust and she always told us, hey, you guys should go use that camera. You should use that camera. And uh, I started traveling quite a bit when I was 16, 17, 18. And so I said, all right, well, I'll bring the camera along to document. And I really enjoyed it. And when I would go on these trips with my family or by myself, I would be taking pictures of all these unique perspectives, this person over in the shape in the shadows over here, and uh, this uh, person with a weird outfit, and this uh, these animals that were up in the tree or whatever, right? And I'd mm. never take family pictures, and my parents were like, "What are you doing, man? Why don't you take <laughs> some family pictures?" And then uh, down the road, I. I ended up making that my my career. Now I'm a, a photojournalist and a photographer, a street photographer, and not really much of like a, a posing portrait photographer. It's all about the story. It's all about the unique perspective of that person's own voice and that person's own journey. And ironically, I bring up the whole mentor thing with my mother because when I first got back from my church uh, mission, I started to... Where was your church mission? Uh, that was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And mm. so half of that was in North Carolina. Half of that was in Tennessee, right in the uh, Smoky Mountains. And so, uh, yeah, when I came back, I said, hey, I'm going to try out being a photographer because why not i've enjoyed it and now i can focus on building a career and i couldn't go back to school at that point because it was like uh, nine months until the until i could enroll so i tried and the guy who was my father's mentee within real estate became my mentor within photography mm -hmm. real estate photography so I moved back to Seattle to start my photography career. And that's when I met the famous Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the guy uh, in Olympia? Scott, yeah. Yeah, nice. That's amazing, was... man. So sorry, keep going. No, I was going to say, I'm just, I was missing a lot of details in this story I, that I know about now. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of bobs and weaves and and goes with the flow because uh that's that that's what my name is my name means big wave it means uh high tide it it it, it, it you know my whole life is just going with the flow and sometimes it crashes and sometimes <laughs> it's a sweet ride you know that's yeah, amazing I was just man. Telling us, 
about uh, how similar we are, like when it comes to um, intuition and and stuff. You know, like we're so different mm -hmm. than he is. He is a very, you know, like very structured, very you know, like planning ahead kind of guy. Well, to yeah. the name kind of thing. So his name is Big Wave, and it crashes, and it has tides. My name it means a sword. It's a type of a sword, Hossein. Mm. So structure, black and white, <laughs> you know. I actually learned that just yesterday. Is is it the seeth? Is it called seeth? Mm, what is seeth? It's Hossein in Arabic. Oh. Seeth is the, is the where the sword goes in and goes out. Oh, is that right? Oh. Sheath. 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 Yeah, my bad. Mm. Sheath. In English, yeah. I think actually Hussam is a synonym to a sword. Really? Yeah. So you can is, it a, a, is it a... You, uh, you pull the Hussam out of the sheath. Is it a single-edged sword or double-edged sword? Hard to know. I tried to find out. <laughs> because you, you know so that there's all these different uh, allegories and... and uh, uh, similes about a double-edged sword and and everything like that and in, in history biblical times and uh, i'm not sure if it's in the quran as as well but uh yeah it's a double-edged sword that's that's a that's a thing man right yeah it can be overactive or underactive it can be positive or it can be negative yeah you gotta be mindful but it's, I find it interesting how our names can actually have, sometimes they don't, but sometimes they have resemblance of who we become. Or it could be the other way. Maybe we're meant to have a certain disposition. So our parents, they're just inspired to choose certain names without knowing, without mm. consciously knowing. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. I'm of, obsessed uh, with names. So I love that you're talking about this. My, you never my fiance asked me about and I, we, we talk about names all the time and we talk about, oh, what are we going to name our kids? And, oh, I just learned this thing about this ancestor and their name. And, oh, that's beautiful. And, oh, my siblings struggle with this part of their name. I feel like I've really grown into my name. How can I help my siblings uh, love their names more? And, and, you know, there's just this whole identity crisis that so much of the world is facing right now, especially in the U.S., uh, and names, I think, are such an important part of that. So I'm glad to hear that that uh, I'm with fellow people that are proud of their names and that that's something that uh, helps you with your identity because that's how I feel about mine. Nice. Yeah, you have a pretty cool name. I never said I'm proud of my name, though. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I am. well ah Ahmed means something about being grateful and being thankful. Yeah. yeah. And he's one of the most grateful right. people I know. Thanks, bro. <laughs> nice. We were a Annie, Annie, my fiance, and I were talking about uh, about that because we were we were hoping that we could host Ahmed for like a month or two at our place and maybe convince him to move out to New York City. And uh, and you know we we're like, oh, okay, how's that going to work? And this and that and. Is it going to be a challenge? What kind of what kind of uh, plans do we need to set for that? And and both Annie and I were like, well, who better than Ahmed because he's just a very gracious person. And I think that being a, a gracious or a grateful person, it it it, it goes miles for for who you are and 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 how you're going to behave in society. Thank right. you, bro. Being gracious. Important. Humbles me. So I don't know. Speaking of names, I don't know if you watched in any of our videos us talking about King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Okay. So it's the four archetypes of the different aspects of all our personalities. Okay. And they have certain characteristics and they can be overactive or, or underactive. And for example, my name, Hossam, it's almost like a warrior's name, right? It's a sword. 
And then your name, I know you, when I think of waves and crashing, I think of emotions. So I would say maybe that's like a lover quadrant or maybe a magician quadrant. Right. Mm -hmm. And also the, the metaphor of Jesus walking on water, the meaning that you can extract from it is he was treading the emotions, the ocean of emotions. A lot of people don't have this ability. We just drown in the ocean of emotions so and then being ahmed being thankful being grateful that's like in the quadrant of a lover or potentially a magician also it has something to do with gratitude you know it's this emotion part that's awesome i just i just think that's interesting i agree yeah. i agree yeah, yeah. I want to say something about photography that my senior year college, I took a photography class and I'll tell you what, man, it was the, one of the few A's that I got in my whole journey in, in college. I just loved it so much. And this guitar behind me, man, I took like really amazing pictures of it just because it has so many details and like the shape of the wood and the grain and the way the light hits it and like these knobs to tune it. So I understand when you say you were not taking pictures of your family, you were taking pictures of unique things, someone in the shadow, right? Then you frame it in a way that it tells a story and it's something that is usually overlooked in day-to-day -day life. But when you slow down, look at the details and portray it in such a way that you see it or that you want to see it, it becomes really unique. Totally, man. Yeah, it's uh I think that's the thing about photography is it's it's funny. I love that you brought that up because in New York we rush around all the time, nonstop. It's a city that never sleeps, it go, 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 rat race, whatever, right? The big apple is a place that is exhausting. And I'm go, 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 like my legs and feet are sore, like every day, you know, I probably walk like six to 10 miles every day. But I love that how you bring up the piece of photography, how it, I mean, when I think of photography, I'm freezing time, I'm freezing an action, it's a frame in, in history, right? And so maybe my constant nonstop wave of emotions and and uh, rat race mentality is battling or balancing out that need or desire to freeze time or be slow and be nostalgic and be sentimental because uh, I don't know, there's this dichotomy within me always that's satisfied and unsatisfied and rushing and slowing down and being present and being lost in the past or in the future. It's, it's the human struggle, I think. We were always in some sort of battle. And I think that that's kind of my, one of my battles is, is go, 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 go. But the mm -hmm. essence of what I do is stop, slow down, listen to the little voices, look at the small details and freeze this, this frame in, in time. Yeah. Ooh. So what would you say, like some of the obstacles were like in the way, um, the things that you talked about were more like internally kind of thing. What would be like, some of the things that were externally like other people or or anything like that and what kept you you know like so persistent yeah uh i think what keeps a lot of artists persistent is curiosity and the constant uh struggle for um, for everything not being good enough and wanting more and wanting to do a better job and you know it, I, 
I wouldn't say perfectionism because I don't think I'm necessarily a perfectionist. I used to be. I had to break that to like actually start gaining a footing within my career and in life. But just wanting more, never being satisfied, and that's something that that the hunger is, is is a struggle and is a strain, and it strains my relationship. It strains my my mental state and my stress. It strains my home and and relationships with family as well. You know, so it's it's a thing. Yeah, I want to go back to you mentioning um, freezing time, freezing history versus the waves of emotions and the go go go. And so we named this podcast peripheral awareness and it's because when we go into a state of peripheral awareness like softening the eyes kind of like instead of focusing on one point you can focus at one point and then you can see like the walls and then you can see even beyond the walls like you can expand your awareness and it's a portal to the spiritual right but then here in the 3d world we face the duality of life the hot and cold and then we have to balance so if my name is Hossam and I'm warrior and I'm go, 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 then my shadow is stillness. I actually need to become aware and mindful that I need to force myself to do things that have stillness, that have freezing time, slowing down. And then what you're describing is from the waves of emotions, you're freezing time in the pictures. You're slowing down, noticing the little things. And it's this dance. So we can sometimes it feels like a struggle, but also sometimes it's like a nice dance when we're in a state of flow and things are going well, or maybe the way we think about it. Like, oh, I've went too far in warrior mode. Let me go back. And then, oh man, I've went too far in my emotions. Let me pull back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It it is. And it's a uh, it uh... I often refer to life as as like a delicate dance or it's like a it's a beautiful dance but it's also a tricky dance uh but it's a dance nonetheless for sure yeah that's amazing i also think of life as a war as a fight <laughs> it's a very aggressive dance sometimes and in the way i perceive it and maybe it's my temperament as well but it's definitely whether you, somebody wants to think of it as a dance, as a game. Yeah, definitely. But when it comes to the question that AT asked, to keep persistent and yes, it impacts the home. It, it Because I've had my journey too, doing artistic stuff. So I studied architecture and within a few months after I graduated and got a job, I realized I want something more. I want something different. Uh, it's not necessarily that I didn't like architecture in itself. I just, the nine to five system I thought was way outdated and there, there's more to life than the weekends. So like I mentioned my guitar in my senior year of college, I learned guitar senior year of college and I fell in love with it. I was like, I can do something maybe. And I had the drive, like I had such a strong drive, but I didn't have necessarily an amazing skill or talent like other people like at he's amazing with music right he has amazing skills and talents way more than i do but i wanted to do something so i experimented for like five years with music and making music and obviously in architecture i can make money anytime i want to and pay my bills but when i play the guitar i feel amazing and the people who listen to it love it but that financial aspect is missing and it's an aspect of, of life that I couldn't ignore, right? So I switched a little bit. I had to do this exercise, Ikigai exercise. It's a Japanese exercise to help us find what we should do in life, our reason for being. And it's four questions. And the four questions, they are related to the king, warrior, magician, lover. And for us to live a balanced life, we want to be in the middle. We want to be integrated. We don't want to be all the way in the lover and ignoring the warrior and the king. We don't want to be 
and maybe I should, for listeners, maybe I should say what is King Warrior Magician Lover a little bit more. But I'll continue before I lose my thoughts. And you don't want to be in magician, but ignore the king and the lover completely is just going to be a fragmented life. It's not going to feel like whole. You're not going to, we're not going to feel very satisfied or fulfilled. So what I ask myself is, what am I good at? Well, I'm good in architecture, but I don't love it. So one quadrant was missing. And then music. I love music, but I'm not excellent at it. Okay, I'm not going to lie to myself. I love it. People love it. But if I'm not good at it, and if it doesn't come to me easily, maybe my progress is not going to be as fast as I would like it to be. And then I figured, hmm, I like to give advice. Like, I like to think. I like to read about self-improvement. Like, maybe I can start leaning into self-improvement and life coaching. And then I started doing that. And then I'm noticing that my progress is faster than my progress was in music. And my progress is faster than maybe my competition, people starting out. Like, hmm, maybe there's something there. So I'm good at it. I love it. People need it and I can get paid for it. I just need to learn these things because these things, we they have to be learned. They're, they're not just there for us. Like in architecture, because there's a whole system that's been around for hundreds of years, if you have the skill, you'll get paid. Somebody's going to hire you. They're going to do the marketing. They're going to do the accounting. You just have to do the work. They're going to provide you with the office. But doing something entrepreneurial like photography, uh, life coaching, or music, you have to be the accountant. You have to be the marketer. You have to be the, the, the warrior that does the actual work. And you have to be the king, the visionary, the leader the CEO, you have to be all four. So it's very challenging, but it's amazing. And it's, it feels like life to me. Like when these four come together, it feels like life. Totally. I love that. No, I, I think balance is so important. Um, you know, there's so many different models of balance. One that we have uh, in my culture and in the Maori culture is uh it's represented by the house it's called tefare tapafa so tefare is the house and tapafa is is of health uh, and well-being and 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 who we are and if you just so so it's displayed like a house um and you have different walls and then you have your roof and if one side is stronger than the other it'll collapse right or the roof will cave in or, or whatever so there's the four different points there's your your taha wairua which is your spiritual your taha hinangaro which is your mental and emotional your taha fanao which is your family and your social and your taha tinana which is your physical well-being and all those things tied together that's that's your overall well-being and what does the house sit on it sits on tefenua or the land and 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 that is what ties you to earth to this mortal existence and while we're on this fenua on this earth uh we if we want to stand up strong and have a sturdy beautiful home and and life we need to have those things all balanced you know if it's the if it's tefare if it's the house or if it is a balance between the warrior the king the magician and the lover uh, or if it's yin yang you know there's all these different models that that are beautiful but balance is is what it's all about and i i, I grew up in a very orthodox religion i grew up in the church of jesus christ the latter-day saints also known as the mormons um and that's a, a very orthodox uh christian religion that is known for being that way um and i think that's why I, I i relate to a lot of muslims i relate to to jews i relate to orthodox 
uh, Catholics or, or uh, you know, being a practicing intense religious person is kind of a rare thing nowadays, especially in the West. Um, but one thing I noticed growing up, uh, and I am still practicing my religion in my own way, uh, as I've found balance and I've learned all these lessons from all these different religions and races and nationalities and, and people and all of their stories. Uh, but one thing that I, I've noticed in some of these Orthodox religions is over prioritization of Taha Wairua of just the spiritual things. So then maybe the physical things or the uh, social things or the emotional things are being cast to the side. And what happens? The house will collapse. That's unsustainable. Uh, or outside of religion, you know, you, you have somebody that uh, prioritizes social things. This is something I used to do a lot as a kid. I think we all have different social learnings as a kid. But when that was my whole life, then my spirituality would would struggle or my um, my emotional well being would struggle. And what happens the house collapses, it's unsustainable. So I think finding a sustainable, balanced life and really taking self care is so crucial. And I'm learning that the hard way and just the life way. But uh, I'm super the grateful for awesome people like you guys to, uh, to help me feel supported throughout throughout those journeys. Uh, I love softies like AT. <laughs> <laughs> He thinks he's hard, but he's he's a big softy. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's amazing. Um, coming together and having a sense of brotherhood or community was so important to me. I joined a community of self improvement. Uh, you know, a group of men who were trying to improve their life, become more virtuous. Last year, and it profoundly changed who I am, that part of me was lacking my whole life. I didn't know what brotherhood was. You know, I didn't know what a sense of community is of people having, striving to become better and striving to live life in a better way, more effective way. And um, and you saying, yeah, you love people coming together and AT is a softie. I always say, I'm an agreeable people. I'm an, I'm an agreeable person and I love agreeable people. <laughs> I love being around agreeable people. They validate totally your happy. emotions. Well, not necessarily because they validate you. Well, it, it's important for the people around you not to, uh, what's the opposite of validate? Neglect or uh, don't acknowledge your emotions. That's very unhealthy. People need, like, you need to have people around you that validate your emotions. That doesn't mean they yeah. tell you, oh, you're amazing. They tell you, oh, I understand how you feel, but you're being an idiot. Like, right. Validate yeah. your emotions and then give me your honest opinion. Yeah, to call but, you out. Right. But agreeable people, for example, if we're going out to dinner, I'd be like, hey, bro, where do you want to eat? What do you feel like? It? A disagreeable person will not ask you, will tell you, hey, do you want to go to this place? Or they'll give you two options. But because I'm an agreeable person, I want to make sure that you're so happy with the choice. And then after I hear what you want to say, I'm going to say, okay, I feel like this one. And I, I, I could go to this one, but I like this interaction back and forth. But other people be like, come on, man, make a decision. Don't be a softie. But no, I'm an agreeable person and I like to have agreeable people around me. Totally. I, I I love I love being with people like that too. It's uh, I, I hope I hope to spend some time with you if uh, if the rumors are true, what I've heard and and what you're saying is true. I I, I think it'd be cool and we can uh, photograph your guitar and and uh, and all that. You're out in Egypt, right? Right now I'm in Maryland. I'm close to you, East Coast, oh, baby. What? 
Dude, yo, we should we should uh, just a train right away. Yeah, it's very close. So T, you do have the mindset of being so open to learn from everyone and everything. And I think this is part of why you're so so easy to talk to and so easy to connect with people and all of that. What makes you people's person is that I just wanted to tie to the question, but so I have a challenging question for you. What is your dream? Like, what's your big dream, whether it's like entrepreneurship or like, and as an employee, what would be your dream job? AT, bring in the heat. I like it. No, that's great. Uh, first off, a thought about the question in general that just dawned on me is, isn't it interesting that we, when we think of dream and aspirations, we immediately go to, uh, maybe not everyone, definitely not everyone, but oftentimes we go directly to like career or to job, which is how I'm hardwired. I'm not like bucking the system mm. saying, hey, no, like, but I'm just thinking that in myself yo, why, why don't I just think, oh yeah, my dream is to have this beautiful life and this beautiful, this, yes, sure. Yeah. I want to have a beautiful wife and a beautiful home and a beautiful family. But my dream that I really want is to be a, a New York Times photographer or a National Geographic photographer. I, I work a lot in... Um, film and motion picture and documentary work and news and i would rather have still pictures be what i do i mean i'm not opposed i love i love motion picture as well i would love to work on planet earth 3 and be out there with the animals or i would love to be doing a documentary about the indigenous people of new zealand my people and you know my tribe specifically and my ancestors and my and the current state of my relatives and whatever uh you know any of those sort of things but i think what i'm missing right now is i'm in the news and it's a daily turn like we just got to pump out these stories quickly which is a good is a good thing to learn how to do as a photographer, videographer, journalist. We just say photojournalist. Uh, it's good because then you can scale or make your workflow more efficient. And then you can actually get stories out and actually complete a task. But now that I've been learning that and, you know, learn a little bit more of that, what I really want is to be able to take time to slow down, to stop and to, to pause and sit with the people and sit on the floor with them and eat or sit in on the porch and watch the sunset with them and talk to them about their life. And, you know, I want it to be 90% of getting to know the person 10% of capturing their essence and sharing their voice and sharing their story in the way that would be reverent and that would be appropriate for them. That's the dream. I don't know if I'd call it my mission statement or my motto, but I want to be a voice to the voiceless. I always love... Uh, like two days ago, I was interviewing a bunch of men from Senegal who are asylum seekers. They they traveled across uh, into Latin America and they traveled up on buses and trains and then they crossed the Mexican border and they've come to the sanctuary city of New York City. But now they're stranded on the sidewalks because the city has too many asylum seekers and they don't know where to house them and they're trying to process them and that's the kind of stuff I want to do I want to do that every day and be able to sit with the people to talk with them to share their story in an appropriate way not just a we we call it 
in news, we call it spraying the area. Basically, like I have my camera and I just spray the area. Boom, boom, boom. Got my video done. Got a couple of sound bites, a couple of interviews done. To me, yeah. that feels uh, a little insensitive. I want to be a little more sensitive in the storytelling and a little more personable and personal with the people. And I feel like that's what the world is craving and wanting with social media, with TV, with entertainment, with education. They want real, not polished and perfect, but the real, the real deal of, of what's going on. Uh, no more lies. People are sick of the lies. So big, long-winded explanation of the dream. But the dream would be true journalism, true photojournalism, pure photojournalism. Yeah, yeah man. You actually had a very strong example, like uh, to to prove like what you were just talking about when you went to Ukraine to try to capture the the war events and all of that. Why don't you tell us about this story? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ukraine was a life-changing project. The things that are going on there now and have gone on over the past, what, year and a half now, and even beyond that, uh, are, are horrible. I was given the chance to go over to Ukraine. I was hired by a company who was a startup company, a software company. Um, and they were just getting funding and they, the, the owner was married to, to a Ukrainian. A few of the people on our team were Ukrainian. And so the owner, the CEO wanted, <laughs> it was, it was confusing to me, but he, and I still don't really know the vision of what was going on there, but he wanted to have a branch of the company that was kind of this free journalism, like, like Vice Media Group, and have short films and documentaries and, and raw stories all, over, all across the board. But we wanted to go to Ukraine and actually talk to the people and actually be there with Ukrainians and not just showing bombs and blood and guts and glory. That's what I always say. Mm -hmm. Bombs, gun, bombs, guns, guts, glory, blah, blah, blah. That's what mass media, that's what the news is showing. And everyone gets overstimulated and watches it and thinks, oh, that's horrible, that's horrible. And then after like, a week, two weeks, a month, two months, people are like, man, on to the next, you know, so who people are kind of talking about Ukraine, uh, you know, like within certain groups. Yeah. But across the board, not a lot. Anyway, project was to create a documentary about everyday Ukrainian life with small businesses, with online companies, with humanitarian efforts, with um, volunteer networks of Ukrainians. And, and no, they were all Ukrainian um, and highlight what life was like before the war during and what they thought it would be like after the war and yeah that's that's what i was hired out there to do and and it was it was a uh, a very interesting experience i don't know what what about it you want you want to know um, I have but a few that's questions. kind of what i was out there for yeah go ahead all right so what was the first thought that came to your mind when the idea was proposed to you uh there like this is what i've 
been waiting for. This is what I have wanted to do. This is what I meant to do. It wasn't even a question of if I should. It was just when. Uh. And I had to come up with a pitch as a lot of uh, contractors or business owners have to for, you know, a bit like a bid or a proposal of, oh, this is what I'm going to do in return for this. And so pitched that whole idea and, and they were on board for it. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was not a matter of if it was just when. Yeah. And then what did you realize when you went there? Like, what can you tell a person like me who is maybe exposed to maybe a few friends that are from Ukraine, but everything else is from mainstream media that I, that I'm fed. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, well, it was funny on my way out there, I heard all sorts of things, right. From family and from friends. And a lot of it was like, well, how do you know? the reality of what's going on you haven't even been there you're just watching the news um and oftentimes when i've done these different kinds of trips or experiences a lot of people are telling you all of the horror stories all the worst stories and and you know sure that is reality but then there's all these other things there's this yeah, there's this funny meme that I saw the other day that was like, what people tell you about, they were saying about Mexico, but it's the same thing with Ukraine, what they tell you about Ukraine or Mexico, and they just show you like, someone that's like, has a gun to their head, and they're like, pinned down to the thing. And, and it's what they what the reality of what Mexico is, and there's like four quadrants, and the bot and the bottom one, Yes, that is still that one. But then there's also like the beautiful beaches. And then there's like the ancient pyramids. And then there's the, and then there's like amazing food, right? So that's, that's what Ukraine was like. Everyone was telling me what it was. And what then could go wrong. I got there. It was that's, crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. There was that stuff. We, mm -hmm. we had to fly into Romania. I was staying in Amsterdam with my family. And I flew into Bucharest, Romania. We had a contact from Ukraine who fled the country when Russia invaded. And she she abandoned her car in Romania. So we landed in Romania. We picked up this car. We replaced the tires. We did a little bit of uh, tune-ups on it. And then we drove for like 26 hours. Um, and we had to, we wanted to go around, uh, through a different, through a certain route so that it was safer. And so we could stay overnight in this one town that was in Western Ukraine and then finish our way all the way up to Kiev, which is where we were stationed as well as all, all the other media people. Um, and so, yeah, we went and it was shocking you know i was all hyped up on what everyone was saying what the what the media was showing me and i got to ukraine and we were at the border and it was like way chiller than even like the mexican border to tijuana you know mm -hmm. i've uh, i've been down to tijuana a bunch of times in my life and you'll you'll wait in line there's like armed guards and walls and like concrete uh buildings and it's all super super secure and sometimes you wait in line for like two three four hours this one when we drove up to the border there was like 30 miles of semi trucks and we were like whoa what the heck but they were just parked on the side of the road and so that was the first thing that was kind of alarming, but I guess they could only cross the border at like certain times and, and like, so that the Russians couldn't see the lights and bomb them and were whatever. they military? 
No, these were just semi trucks, like commercial trucks. Mm. And then, so so that was the first thing. So we thought we were going to wait forever, but we really just waited for like an hour. And it wasn't because the line was long. It was because they had like two or three people that were just like, okay, why are you here? Stamp, stamp, stamp. Just like any kind of border crossing. It was, it was, it was interesting um, how easy it was. And there were some humanitarian tents around, um, but that's it. You know, I mean, I was, we, we, we went into the country in June of 2022 which you know uh the 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 beginning of the invasion was what february of 2022 so four months Mm. or so had passed um and then we drove and there would be along the highway a lot of different uh checkpoints and so there were these big cinder block uh bunkers that were basically on the side of the road and they were covered up with what looked like uh like a bunch of t-shirts all tied together uh, so that it would look like it was just a bush and then and only occasionally would there be military in those and sometimes they would like have a checkpoint where you'd have to come up and you'd have to show them your passports and um and it was funny i was in our car there were three of us one that was on a ukrainian passport she was our translator one on an italian passport and one on a new zealand passport i actually lost my u.s passport so so i was just (laughs) traveling on my new zealand passport um but yeah it it was fine It, it, it really wasn't too tricky but what was interesting was we were trying to drive farther, but we went to a, a rest area to get gas and because uh, we kept hearing, oh, yeah, yeah, there's like no gas anywhere. You're going to run out of petrol. Uh, the It's chaos. And so we kept filling up like a lot and we had these extra tanks. We had a, it was a hybrid car that took like a LPG as well. So we like made sure that it was full all mm. the time. I've never stopped at so many gas stations in my whole mm. life. It was like freaking 30 gas yeah. stations within, it was like a gas station every hour on the road trip, right. you know? Um, and we, uh, we stopped at one and we were trying to find food and there was this old cathedral that was acting as a military base now. And so there were all these people dressed in camo and you would see camo everywhere, camo vehicles. That just meant that it was, uh, you know, military people and they actually outlawed normal people wearing camo, uh, so that it couldn't be confused um and it and it would be a separator for civilians and military personnel so we were were, we were always stressed but especially early on when we'd come up around all these military people and they have all of their like i don't know i don't know i don't know the ukrainian version or what version, but I don't think they had AKs because those are Russian. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but they had their big semi-automatic rifles or whatever around them. They had all their ammo packs and they'd come up to you, right? And and ask you for your documents. And 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 we were always super worried. And and they they said, No, you don't have time for dinner. You don't have time to drive to that location. You have to get to a hotel immediately. And we were like, what? We were like, what do you mean? Because the curfew was at 10 p.m. It was like at 10 p.m., uh, which is where everyone's supposed to be inside, no lights on in the homes, no driving around, or you could be arrested. Um uh because you know the lights and the russians could 
find you and bomb you. And it's crazy because I'd heard all of these stories from my grandmother who was in the bombings in London as a as a young girl in World War II. And I felt like, oh wow, I'm I'm like I'm living this now. So we quickly got to a hotel. It was this beautiful hotel. There was like this horse uh, track, equestrian field and park, and they were training and all that the next day, but it was shut down, super dark. We got in there, we got into our rooms, and that's when we started hearing the air raid sirens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that oh, that first night, it was like, that that's when it all dawned on me, you know, across the border, there were those few experiences. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it didn't feel real. You know, it was like, there's no war. It's just like the countryside with these random load of blocks on the side of the side of the road, but not much to it. Just a lot of fields and, and wheat and sunflowers and green crops and whatever because ukraine has so much of that um so so it it felt like we're just driving through idaho i don't know if you guys have heard of idaho but that's like that's like the that's like the ukraine of the united states you know it's it's just fields and like people here and there small towns here and there but it just felt like i was in idaho which is beautiful i mean i i love the country but then when I heard the air raid sirens and when we were told about the curfew and no, you got to go and we're starving, I was like, oh man, this is real. And I I wasn't scared. I was just excited. <laughs> I was like, man, this is crazy. I can't believe these people have had to go through all this, but I'm very grateful that I'm here and I hope that I can help in some kind of way so we wake up the next day we get and and we get this nice classic ukrainian breakfast is like these little um cottage cheese pancakes basically and fresh fruit and whatever and we just boom we just zip over to to kiev as quick as we can and you didn't get say out boom in, in this kind of situation like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I boom, said, what the hell? I, mean, <laughs> I know it's like it's like when it's like when you're in the uh, when you're in the airport and 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 you're like, oh man, because well, well, I, I I'm a photographer, right? And often we say, oh yeah, I'm I'm shooting, or, or, or oh, like shoot. I'll be. I'll, I'll be at the pro I'll be out in the projects, which is like the the um the public housing here in New York. And there's a lot of shootings with guns that happen there. And 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 so we'll, we'll go out and most of the time we, we refer to these things as like a shoot or like, mm. oh yeah, did you shoot that? Or mm-hmm. oh yeah, sorry, I'm shooting this. No, 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 no. You, you can't say that. I'm, I'm learning that. I'm learning that in the streets, you know. Oh, yeah. And you I'm can filming. pass as an Arab, too. So, yeah, that's yeah. More, totally. more dangerous. <laughs> totally, man. Yeah. So, so, uh, so anyway, we get to Kiev. I'm like, dude, the Kiev is amazing. It's beautiful. All the buildings are colorful. There's, there's all, most of the Ukrainian churches are these huge uh, churches, usually blue with gold domes and uh and it's just it's one of the most beautiful countries i've ever been to people are all out everyone was out in the street uh walking around and man i i kid you not there's i i've been all around the world there's never been a place that there's been the most like styly beautiful people okay beautiful women the men are not so beautiful <laughs> there, um, but they're very manly and very, uh, very tough and very, uh, you know, warrior. Uh, um, but the but the women, like ninety nine out of ten women there are like dressed up. They um, have great style and they have they all pulled together makeup and hair and everything and they'll be like riding an electric scooter 
and like biking and just walking and and and, and everyone's out and about and and it, i kid you not nine out of ten women are like nines nine out of ten and then and 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 this really really was a big a big shocker because then i went to london right after and like one out of ten women in in london <laughs> but but anyway anyway beside the point um the i bring that up because it's beautiful and then every single restaurant we went to was like every single detail was paid attention to to the garnish in the drink they have all these super nice lemonades they have all these cocktails and and uh soft drinks and and you name it every single detail the way it was glass the way that it was um blended or or mixed or they put a garnish on was it was just like perfect every single plate the 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 coloring the style of the plates the the um the foods and the different varieties ukraine is like is almost like all ukrainian in kiev it's not like a big multicultural city but they have they have japanese food and they have uh they have afghan food and they have uh chinese food and they have african food and they have ukrainian food and they have italian food they have all the different types of uh, uh cuisines all made by ukrainians and made better than most of the most of the chinese restaurants i've been to or better than the better than the i don't know mexican restaurants i've been to uh, uh around and i'm like what the heck and it's so cheap super cheap like the whole atmosphere that you're that you're sitting in while you're eating or you're shopping or whatever is just beautiful and it's super cheap and you don't have to tip and the, the waiters are the best waiters the workers in the retail shops are the are the are super nice super helpful and i, I was like wh where am i am i in paradise like what the heck there's a war was, going on i was gonna say the story started off as you know danger and like being cautious and kind of like dark and their stress and then started sound like this is a vacation spot yeah man it was crazy <laughs> i felt like i was living the high life like i was I, like i was living like some royalty the best food my whole life and and it was just like meal after meal after meal and i was like buying clothes from all and, and the and the ukrainian brands are so proud to be ukrainian even before the war because ukrainians as a people are so independent so creative so um ingenious they they have an app for everything but not in like the annoying kind of way they have an app that's like an official app where when you're in the country you can have you can vote through the app you have your uh your government id you have your driver's license you have your passport you have everything on this app and it's super easy to use it's beautiful like the ui is insane and and you know you you just have to go to the club with your phone you don't have to have your mm. stupid passport or whatever you you can go mm fly just with your phone or, or whatever you know like they've just thought of all these different things and they just make them happen mm -hmm. um so i was just i was shocked because i was expecting all the things that i've been told and, you know it was a little scary getting there yeah and then you know we're in there and and one of the uh the ceo guy that i was with he wanted to go get a haircut right so we're sitting and he's getting a fresh fade and then mm, mm, mm. the sirens start going off. The Ukrainians just like look up ah, and they just mm. keep going about their day. They've been living through this war for so long. So many people who were either rich, had family or friends that were abroad or like struck up some kind of weird deal to get out of the country, they left. Mm -hmm. All the right. rest of the people have to deal with the same crap every single day mm -hmm. and air raid after air raid after air raid because Russia is just sending missile after missile after missile all across the country. 
and uh people just have to deal with it oh they also have an app for that for the air raids there's an air raid app yeah and so it would show you what province like is in danger that it's flying over and i mean most of the time when when you watch the big news you don't see that many missiles hitting that's because of nato because of the ukrainian army because of uh the anti aircraft guns that they have most of the missiles didn't touch down because they were all shot down mm. and pulverized over fields or whatever and so when there were missile strikes that succeeded that it you know it's usually like one or two slipped through or they just did like thousands and in, in one concentrated area in Kharkiv or in Mariupol or mm. in Irpin or all these different areas um and and uh yeah so so when we see the places that were devastated I went to some of those that that were close by I went to Bucha and I went to Irpin and I went to Borodyanka um those were places where Vladimir Zelensky the president of Ukraine um would do his speeches in front of these apartment buildings that were just raised and uh and you know he, he would wear these shirt i am ukrainian and so who did who did i get to interview the people who created that shirt that caused this whole movement um and so yeah we were there uh interviewing them and talking to them about about it um you know so so i would go in after the aftermath and talk to these people and kind of check it out and, and see what their thoughts were on it and that's that's also where it dawned on me again um you know i went from from being a little nervous a little scared oh this is real to like whoa this is like fancy this city is super cool this is my favorite city ever blah 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 then back to when i went to those areas and seeing the mass graves where they had to clear out a half of a forest and there's just like hundreds of mounds of people that were just buried and not they didn't dig into the ground they didn't have time for that so they just put their body down and just covered them with dirt and there's just like a plaque and flowers on top of all those just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds it looks like ant hills across the across the field so that was striking um i interviewed okay. the uh the uh i guess like president or something of uh irpin and when he it struck me when he was speaking in ukrainian but when my translator told me that he what he was saying i could tell it was emotional but i didn't know what he was saying and and he was talking about how he knew from god that he needed to be there so that he could help these families while all of their men were out at the front lines dying or fighting or struggling for freedom to bury the bodies of the loved ones that were lost in the town and so that that was really really uh striking going to these arts and uh, art and cultural centers and seeing them blasted and burned out you know it, it reminded me of the stories you you hear about the nazis and how they would go in and try to just destroy people at their cultural center and at their uh core um and destroy their their history um that that was that was really striking uh but at the same time you know i'd be going through a park and there would be bullet holes and shrapnel uh like scraps and and destruction uh through the trees and the buildings and the and the coffee shops and whatever and there would be three generations there'd be a grandpa two parents and uh 
and two little kids running around at the park. Yeah, the playground had holes inside of it from the war, but people are just trying their best to live their live their life and be live as normally as possible. So it was uh yeah, that was really shocking to mm. see. Yeah. I remember my grandma would tell me that in her neighborhood they would build walls in front of the building entrances, concrete walls. And this is just so so when uh, bombs or missiles hit and then I don't know what's it called, the scattered pieces of the um, would not go into the building and hurt people that may be there. And she told me that when uh, like that sound. Sirens. Yeah, the sirens. They would say, which means turn off all the lights or turn off all the lights. Um, yeah. but I think what you're, what you did there was very courageous and it's true to your mission. Um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that that is something to be acknowledged for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I could, I mean, I've met and I've talked about it before. And I think a lot of these stories he hasn't even heard. I could speak for days about it. I'm already long-winded. Yeah. Long yeah. yeah, I want to be I, respectful I of time too long. because yeah. you have to be somewhere. Um yeah. I just make sure. yeah, I've got I've got to go to go into uh my last day of work before my mother comes into town. So nice. amazing. Amazing. But it's been a it's been such a pleasure meeting you, Hoss. And I hope to see you now. You're in Maryland, dude. So yeah. uh yeah we'll we link should, up we should link up and uh maybe when at comes out to the east coast for a visit that might be the driver to get us all together and well hold on um, before we wrap up things i just yeah, wanted yeah, to yeah. say one one thing real quick so yep. um big thing that you have done like what you, from your story is that you didn't really believe um what people kept telling you like or to try to scare you not to go there you know like and you didn't even mention fear uh which was would be the typical reaction to anyone that would be asked to go to a war zone they'd be like are you freaking kidding me do you want me to send me to a war zone you know unless you play call of duty i think it's that really reflects that you have to just like experience it yourself in order to know like to get real solid reality of what's actually going on instead of you know like keep hearing that uh, things to avoid you have you can have million reasons why you should you shouldn't go there and why you should me and my cousins yesterday we were just talking about how crazy it is to go skydiving and like you can talk about millions of things that could go wrong right how you can die and why would you put in yourself in this kind of situation and same for scuba diving or any like something that includes a lot of risk into it so um but yeah but when you experience that you have an amazing story to tell like like this one uh this will be passed on to your you know like kids and and all of that and and um and yeah it's just like we were just talking about fear uh, a couple of days ago. Mm. The true meaning of happiness is, is the other side of fear, like Will Smith said, and, and I truly believe that. So amazing example, man. Proud of you, bro. Thank you, man. Where um, can myself and other people see what you've documented? Do you, I don't know how active you are in social media, if you have a website. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am not as active on my website, so you could probably go over to the um, my Instagram uh, or Facebook, and it's just Tainui Photo, T-A-I-N-U-I-P-H-O-T-O. And yeah, people could either look that up on Instagram or Facebook and, and uh, see those things. Um, trying to think about 
because I think the company, the company that I was out there doing the documentary with, I think that they've now gone under or, or it doesn't look like they're doing too well. Um, and they're kind of private about it, but I think they pulled the documentary off of their YouTube mm. and there were supposed to be multiple parts. I have the original file and I, I posted it on my Facebook page. People can watch that part one of the documentary there. Um, but yeah. Depending on the time you have, hopefully you have a few more minutes. Your next big project, the documentary about New Zealand and specifically our tribe. Give me a time frame on that. Yes, yes, yes. That's the important part about goals, right? Um, so I'm getting married next year in May. We want to be here for... This is the tricky one, man. This is the tricky one. We definitely want to live in New Zealand at some point. And we say we need to. I think it would be really cool if we were there with little kids. So we want to get married first and then have probably have a few years uh, together. So we're thinking we'll probably be in New York for uh, two to five years. And then depending on what work uh, opportunities come up, uh, I'd say five years from now, and we might move straight over to New Zealand and, and have the kids out there. That sounds awesome. How long would a documentary take to start and complete? Uh, it depends how, how big of a production it would be um which i i hope it would be a big production and i could be a integral leading part within that if it was a bigger production it could probably take a year um if it was a smaller production that was more like a passion project or it was a uh, kind of a standard journalism project maybe two weeks to three months. So it could be, could be pretty quick. I would prefer it to be a long in-depth analysis and study and uh, film and, and whole process. Sounds amazing. So. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for your looking, time. We'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for coming on for coming on the show. I love yeah. it. I really enjoyed it. I can go for way longer, but we'll have I you know. on again. We'll, hopefully, we'll have you. I'll have to have you up uh, sometime, and and we'll we'll sit around the kava bowl and have a fight kava. I, yeah, I can tell you about that. It's uh, something from from my my own family culture and 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 all that and and it gives us hours and hours and hours to sit around listen to good music drink this nasty mm. mud water and just mm. talk plus nice. you would love this experience knowing you i know you would absolutely love it mm. okay put it in the books yeah right. with or without at <laughs> <laughs> all right guys this was amazing any last words to end with Love and peace. You guys are awesome. Love and peace. Love you guys. Love you guys. Talk soon. Peace, peace out. Brother. Before you go, if you enjoy this content, hit the like and subscribe button in order for the knowledge to reach more people. Also, check out my website for free self-improvement tools and to book one-on-one -on -one sessions to work with me to create transformational changes that will positively impact your life forever. Stay well, and I'll see you in the next video.